Acest program este sponsorizat de practică. Pentru ideile tale. on how it's made. Thermometers. Produce scales. Aircraft painting. And luxury chocolates. You can sense the difference between hot and cold, but a thermometer puts a number on it. The concept is simple. Heat causes liquid to expand, forcing it up a glass column with a scale attached to it. Italy's Galileo came up with the idea in 1593. Incredibly, these century-old thermometers can still tell the temperature, but modern versions are a bit more precise. To make one, they clamp glass tubing onto a carousel. As it spins, torches heat the center of the hollow glass, while below, the operator pumps air into it. This causes the melted glass to blister. They break the tubing at the blister, creating two tubes with funnel-shaped openings. They anchor a shorter glass cylinder on a turntable and suspend one of the funnel mouth tubes above it. The tubes spin in concert as torches melt them together. The funnel ensures that the melting doesn't close the hollow tube. Another torch now aims further down the cylinder. It seals the end and shapes it into a bulb. To test a sample of the production run, they heat the entire length of the tubing. This creates vacuum pressure so that when they place the open end in liquid wax, the tubing sips it up like a straw. By watching the liquid ascend, they confirm that the thermometer fills as it should and has the right dimensions. Next, the glass tubing swirls on a carousel as flames and forced air work together to form a longer blister. Again, they break the tubing at the blister. This blister creates openings that allow them to snake a narrow, hollow wire through the tubing, joining the two sections. Flames melt and seal the glass around the wire. This is called a glass-to-metal weld, and it creates a more flexible thermometer. They cool the welded glass and wire on a conveyor. Next, they turn on a vacuum pump for several hours to pull the air out of the wire and tubing. This draws the blue liquid wax up, but this time it's not a test. The wax is a non-toxic alternative to mercury that will expand and contract with changing temperature. The thermometers now travel through chilled alcohol, shrinking the blue liquid down to the closed end of the thermometer. As the tubing turns, flames follow the top end to melt and close it. A heat gun below then drives the liquid up the tubing and the air pressure creates a bubble in the end that was just closed. This bubble will be the thermometer's expansion chamber. They plunge the thermometers in ice water to calibrate the blue liquid to zero degrees Celsius. They scratch the glass at that mark. Next, the thermometers warm up in a bath set at 93.3 degrees Celsius. The blue liquid shoots up, and they make another scratch. They align the two scratches in the thermometer with markings on a printed grid. The distance between the two scratches often varies, so by measuring against this grid, they can categorize the thermometer. They then match the thermometer with a corresponding scale.
they install the top section of the thermometer in a case, which can be metal or plastic. They then choose the appropriate scale and slide it between the glass tubing and case. They wrap part of the wire capillary around a joint and then cap it. The sensor bulb of this thermometer will be used to gauge the temperature inside industrial piping, so they protect it with a metal sleeve, called a bulb chamber. A glass window slides easily into the grooves of the casing. A plastic cap is the finishing touch. And now these thermometers are ready to gauge the highs and lows of industrial processing and they're sure to measure up to expectations. Much of what you buy in the produce department of your supermarket is sold by weight, so the store usually hangs a scale at the end of the aisle on which you can weigh your purchase before heading off to the checkout. This is typically a type of scale with fairly simple mechanics. Internal springs spin a pointer to the correct weight mark on a dial. The weight of produce hanging in the pan pulls on a pair of springs inside the scale. They move the various internal components that turn the pointer to the corresponding weight mark on the dial. To make the scale's frame, a press stamps a steel plate five times, progressively cutting and bending it into the final frame shape. A washer goes into each steel spring. They turn it up or down to adjust the spring's tension. That's how they'll calibrate the scale later. The top part of each spring will bolt to the frame, and the bottom part to this slider, a long metal component with weight markings. Next, they attach a component called a rack to one end of the slider, securing the screw tightly with thread locking fluid. The rack's teeth will mesh with this pinion gear and turn it. They install one end of the pinion into the frame. Then they screw on a metal bridge to support the other end. They insert the slider with the rack attached through the bridge. Now when you pull on the slider, the pinion turns. Next, they attach the springs to the frame and slider. Each spring in this imperial scale supports up to 20 pounds, making this a 40 pound scale. When weight pulls on the springs, they move the rack, which turns the pinion, which rotates the scale's pointer. A press stamps out the dial face from a steel plate. After painting it white, they print on the markings with a silk screen press. They insert a spring to prevent the rack from slipping on the pinion. Then they put the face over the bridge so that the pinion protrudes through a hole in the middle. A guide helps them align the face so that the zero will be in the right spot. Then they tighten two screws to attach the face. A press stamps the pointer from a thin sheet of aluminum. Using a special tool, they twist the end, forming a thin tip that won't obscure the fine line to which the pointer's pointing. Next, a coat of red paint, so the pointer will stand out against the black and white face. Once the paint's dry, they mallet the pointer onto the pinion. Now they hang the pan on the scale and turn a little screw in the slider to adjust the pointer to zero. This ensures the scale will weigh just the produce rather than the produce and the pan. Now they calibrate the scale. To do this, they load it with weights to full capacity, which is 40 pounds for this scale. If the pointer doesn't indicate 40 pounds on the nose, they turn the washer in each spring to adjust the resistance.
Then they adjust the pointer back to zero again. This is what they call a double dial scale, meaning it has a face and pointer on each side. They install the second dial on the opposite end of the pinion so that the two pointers move in unison. They close up the space between the two dials with a strip of white plastic. This sash ring, as it's called, has grooves for the dials and for the transparent plastic cover that goes over them. Hanging scales can have dials or digital readouts, and they come in a wide range of capacities, from your common 20 pound or 10 kilogram grocery model, to heavy duty 600 pound or 272 kilo scales designed to pull their weight in industry. Programul continuă cu practică. La ora 21, tehnici esențiale de supraviețuire în cele mai dificile zone de pe glob. Iar de la 22, tehnici de supraviețuire urbană. Ber înfruntă pericolele din oraș. Situații limită în medii necunoscute la 22.30. Tehnici de supraviețuire urbană. Când ai nasul înfundat, nu poți respira normal. Vibrocin desfundă rapid nasul.